welcome to Clothing Culture. I'm Emily Lane. I'm Brett Schnetker. We speak with experts where we explore the global dynamics that shape trends in the fashion industry. Brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global production and design house with over 30 years of industry experience. clothing culture. In this episode, we're talking about navigating social compliance in the garment industry. This is a topic that repeatedly comes up in conversations with existing and prospective clients when discussing factory partners and apparel manufacturing. Stars Design Group CEO Brett Schnicker is here once again as our apparel industry expert on this topic. Welcome, Brett. Thank you. So I think this is one of those topics that's relatively complicated. There's a lot of confusion around social compliance versus social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. So can maybe we start with some basic definitions? What's the difference and help us understand some of those distinctions? Sure, you're right. It is a pretty complex landscape because you know, social compliance, social responsibility means different things in different parts of the world. We live in a big world. You know, we certainly have heard things on the news recently that, you know, paint a really varied landscape in terms of perspective on that. But social responsibility is more of a self-governance issue. It's more um, an internal look, um, governing, ensuring that you're not, you know, internally violating um, ethical, environmental, um, uh, community um, standards. So it's, it's something that you would look internally and, and achieve and set some guidelines in which you would self-navigate that. Social compliance is, uh, is externally regulated. And again, there are a number of agencies that, ex- that regulate that, but at the very minimum standard, it is taking the laws and regulations of a particular country in which perhaps in our business we're manufacturing in and ensuring that the factories and the production sources, um, the trim sources are following the country's guidelines for rules and regulations. And again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, that landscape is widely varied. And so understanding that is really important. And I think there are a lot of tenants that govern that, just making sure at the basic level that workers' rights are covered um, and that they have a voice um, and that there's protections in place. Um, There's a lot of violations and, and human rights issues around the world. And I think that these organizations uh, really strive to set standards that we who economically engage with them understand that the that certain ones do and certain ones don't follow these these regulations. In the end it really kind of comes down to humans, community and environment, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So who um, who is making these determinations and how would a brand or retailer know that they're being socially compliant? Sure. Um, There are at least 10, and I'll call them regulatory agencies, because they probably self-identify in different ways. Um, And they are, you know, ones that are probably more readily used in our industry are people like RAP. Um, It's a Virginia-based organization. Um, Better Work, BSCI, AIM, Fair Labor Association, um, Ethical Trade Initiative, um, and there are more. Um, and I think that these agencies each um, create these standards um, to help um, f- factory owners set in place um, processes that from a, in some cases, at minimum from a country level, they're following rules and regulations, but some of these organizations take it to a completely different level so that there's this global view of what we consider workers' rights to be, and they start to introduce those or enforce those in different uh, certification processes that say that, hey, they they manage um, workers' welfare in a way that we globally recognize that to be good and just. This certainly is a lot to navigate. And to make this easier, we've put all of this information into a PDF, which you can download 
on our website at starsdesigngroup.com. This has become a real emphasis for a lot of companies, especially with the headlines that we're seeing, Chinese cotton and the ca cancel culture really at an on all time high. And I'm curious, Brett, with your experience, are there things that you've seen that might have given you some red flags that maybe something was amiss? Are there, um, you know, things that, that would be good cues to be looking out for? Well, certainly there are some obvious ones. Um, but a lot of this means that you've got to be engaged. You've got to be as present as you can be in a global world, and certainly COVID's made that more difficult. Um, you know, I remember a time in 2016, I was having a conversation with a pretty large surfwear supplier, and we were dialoguing about some outerwear, and, and uh, there was certainly a costing challenge. Now, always supplier to brand or supplier to... Um, to store, there's always costing challenges. We live with that every day. But the gap was so tremendously wide that caused me to ask some more questions. And so some of the follow-up questions were, where specifically are you making? And mm -hmm. the reply was Harbin, China area. That's Northern China um, in a unique location, very close to the North Korean border. Mm -hmm. And when you start to put, and you know, follow-up questions were, how often do you go to the factory? Do you have people in the lines viewing production every day? Oh, well, we've certainly inspected the factory. Um, it looks good. You know, these things, when you see these lack of certification conversations, when you hear that they've kind of done what's called a hit and run inspection, hey, okay. looks good, looks fantastic. Um, in rural parts, uh, strategically and geographically located to what I call near proximity, yeah, of, hot zones right. that could be could be problematic. Um, you know, uh, it leads you down a path to understand that there could be some you you know unique things going on, and and so you know I ended up you know having a conversation that was my suspicion that more than likely based upon all the questions that I had asked that indeed it was being made in North Korea. Um, he vehemently, of course, denied that that would be the possibility, that he'd been working with a supplier for years. And, uh, and funny enough, it was, it was, I think, a day after the conversation, front page news came out that this particular supplier was manufacturing in North Korea. Oh my gosh. Um, and uh, they had caught them in the act. Many times that's unintentional by the so. brand. They don't, sure. you know, they're not going, hey, I'm, I'm making a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go produce in North Korea so I can end up on front page news. Um, it's just the fact that we live in a big world and, mm. and production being the way that it is, the challenges with costing being the way that it is. Um, if you're really dedicated to initiatives in that space, it's important to do your homework and be present or have people that are present when you start to see warning signs and caution signs. You know, again, I reemphasize that, look, we live in a big world. It is difficult to keep your yeah. finger on the pulse of everything that occurs, especially when there are governments kind of working against you in some right. cases. You know, they want to produce, they want to hit a uh, price point, they want to do it profitably. And so you can't be everywhere. We've right. certainly learned with with uh, COVID and certain situations in the in the country that evidently where it began, mm -hmm. um, how difficult it was to navigate that space in some cases. And so, you know, we do our best. And that's why some of these certification, certification agencies can be helpful. They have boots on the ground. They can help you um, ensure and vet that for sure. Sure. So, you know, some takeaways from that would be, if it sounds too good to be true, you know, pricing's too great or something along that lines, you know, that might be the case. It's just a little too good to be true. Yeah, there's there's a there's a significant amount of pressure in our business to keep pricing the same as it was from years ago, and mm -hmm. certainly keep your company afloat, being profitable. Yeah. You know, there was another situation um, years before that in 2013 in Bangladesh that was a tragedy that made front page news um, in Bangladesh. It was the Rana Plaza disaster, and mm -hmm. and um, you know. There was a situation in Bangladesh that happened before that. Bangladesh is a country that survives, I think, 85% of its export uh, dollars are really uh, tied to, um, export earnings are tied to the garment industry. Wow. And so this is a really important sector for them. And, 
you know, you go to Bangladesh for one reason, the ability to produce large volumes at inexpensive prices. That's kind of the big mm -hmm. thing that Bangladesh, um, you know, touts. And, you know, there is, um, there is a lot of challenge in that country in terms of workers' rights and worker safety. And Rana Plaza was one of those, those situations, I think. Um, you know, over a thousand people died. There were twenty three hundred people injured. It was a it was a horrible tragedy. Yeah. I think one of the things that we, as a as a as a group of garment industry professionals, need to understand and recognize, is that we do have economic power, and with that economic power, we can really solicit change when it comes to workers' rights and worker welfare. Um, you know. I think from a personal standpoint, it was, I think, difficult for me to see, while some remained committed and use economic power to make things for the better, on the whole, a number of organizations that were producing in Bangladesh ran. They didn't want to be associated yeah. with the situation. They didn't want to be associated with the country. That kind of works in reverse. Mm -hmm. When you have a country that relies on apparel products as a majority of their export earnings and you run from the country all of a sudden what's left there's no welfare in the country you know it workers need to work they need to get paid whatever they get paid and they need that helps put food on the table and put roofs over their head when as an industry we run from situations like this i think we exacerbate the situation and to the to date Bangladesh is still dealing with ramifications and still to this date has not improved workers' rights and worker safety to the level that it needs to. And I think that when we look at, you know, that situation, there's a heck of a lot more we could be doing as a group to say, look, we want to produce, we want to help, you know, provide, you know, food and, and, and shelter for the workers uh, in Bangladesh. Um, but we have certain standards and mm -hmm. we want them to be safe and we want their, them to have rights. And as a group, if we could organize and get together and, and enforce that, I would think that it affects change in nations. I think it's a really important point. You know, I can certainly see the challenge there. You know, the, the, economically, that must have been devastating to have all of these companies uh, pull away after, uh, after such a, um, a traumatic uh, yeah. Example. Uh, you it's know, sometimes just easier. You know, hey, we're doing business. This is a hot subject. Yeah. We're just better till it gets fixed to pull away. And in many cases, I think we're called to a greater standard, get engaged and yeah. Try well, the, the economic impact you'd mentioned, you know, 84, yeah. 85 percent of yeah. the economics of that country are tied to apparel. So, you know, I can see the challenges, um, you know, socially and, and for yeah. the companies uh, to, to, to step up and create those standards that are needed for yeah. better worker welfare. But I, that's what I love about your suggestion of the, the it's really um, a bigger uh, responsibility. You often talk about being a citizen of the world. Yeah. And so as a citizen of the world and, you know, other companies that are in this space, how can we as a community yeah. help support um, change? In well, and places? I think recognizing, you know, after being in 70 countries for a long time and spending time in places that aren't typical, you know, more rural locations and really seeing countries for what they are, we also have to be careful not to put the American lens on the international landscape, mm. realizing that, you know, we're a young country, our, you know, we're talking about failures as it, rel as it relates to our welfare system and other systems and governmental systems breaking down. You know, we're starting to see that. Other countries, you know, it's interesting when I was traveling with people, you know, I love India. I've always loved India. But some people who have not been outside the U.S. very often and will go to India for the first time, you know, it's a different space. You got yeah. 1.5 billion people and they look at it and in their own naivete, maybe, they look at it and they say, wow, when are they gonna, going to become civilized like right. the U.S.? <laughs> and I think when I drop the bomb on them, they get, they get pretty anxious. But I say, civilized, they're a lot more civilized than we are. We're a 200-year-old country. India's been around for thousands of right. years. This is our future, not our past. <laughs> and so I, I think they, you know, understanding, you know, that dynamic worldwide is that 
you know, there are countries that are significantly older than ours that have grown in population that realize, you know, that certain things break down when things become unwieldy for certain governments. And I think, you know, we have to recognize those situations for what they are within individual countries. We have to understand that while the standard of living in certain places may not meet our level of standard of living, mm -hmm. you know, the really key important facts are, is that are they, be are they being treated fairly? Are they making, you know, a daily wage or the family making daily wage? Because in many cases, the alternative would be nothing. There is right. no welfare. And so, you know, there is always this interesting tightrope we walk pushing for the compliances and the standards that we want. And I think some of those things don't cost, don't have to cost more. Right. Um, and understanding that that ecosystem has to maintain itself in such a way. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a dialogue that we should all be having. Sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable, but understanding that, look, it's important for us. I think it's important for the world to recognize that, you know, and us in the industry, especially that these people work tirelessly to provide, you know, livings for us. And how can we make things better? And, you know, we, we tend to have an economic advantage and we can make change to, you know, economic advantage. And those changes may be incremental in time. Mm -hmm. You know, it may require a combination of technology and oversight and understanding and, you know, all those type of elements. And then it, that, it, that it won't happen immediately, but a consistent dialogue will help change things in time. You know, we are still in the midst of um, an unprecedented time. You know, we've been going through COVID. We're seeing some, you know, positive evolution there. But it certainly during this time put a lot of a lot of stress on the supply chain. How do you see that stress um, impacting uh, the perception uh, or, or priority of social compliance? And you know, do you do you see this um, becoming even more difficult to navigate? As yeah. a result. Yeah, I think this has been a challenging time for the world. Um, in our industry, I believe that COVID wiped out over $1.2 trillion of our of revenue um, in general. And, and when you're dealing with those kind of things, you know, we've all heard about these cancellations that occurred during COVID. You know, we chose to handle things a little differently you know, mm -hmm. we believe that that um, we're responsible uh, for our partnerships long term. And so, you know, I, I don't think that everyone chose that path. Everyone has their own reasons for doing what they do. But I think um, there was over $40 billion in payments that are outstanding. I think wow. still to this date, there's, oh there's over 18 billion that are due these factories. Many won't survive this. Uh, many haven't survived. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's the, some of the stories are heartbreaking when you yeah. hear them, that people have been doing a great job managing social compliance, really caring for the factory and growing things, sometimes it's family legacies, and then having this thing hit, they're wiped out. And there's no, you know, they don't have PPP, they don't have CARE Act, they don't have idle loans, right. you know, they're, they're just done. Uh, and there are a lot of people coming after them. One of the unfortunate situations is that it works its way down to the workers. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're seeing as of today is that $3.2 billion in, in, in money that was owed to workers or expected has still not been paid. And, you know, you have to say, well, that's wrong. They, they should absolutely be paid. Yes, they should absolutely be paid. But these these factories work on small margins. Some of them, you know really slim month to month and there is no way to bail out a factory worldwide mm -hmm. especially in some of these countries and so you know when we when our industry did what they did for whatever reasons the impact goes right back to the worker in terms of sure. all that so we can care about social compliance we care about all these things we can tell all these stories but we have to recognize that again in our economic strength and yeah. our economic decisions whether we're talking anywhere in the world as a purchaser in the garment industry there are ramifications to our decisions that Absolutely. kind of fly in the face of our 
our overall desire to, to make workers' lives better. You know, there absolutely is a domino effect to various decisions, yeah. you know, pulling, pulling out of these factories, leaving them with these bills, Yeah. you know, uh, it's going to decrease our options. Well, I certainly, you know, for a long time, there has been this kind of, there's been rhetoric in our industry about, hey, we're good partners, we partner with our factories, we're in this together. And I think COVID showed that that may not be particularly true for all parties that, that experienced the COVID woes. Um, and so manufacturers overseas are, are trying to look into different ways to secure their livelihood, as you can imagine, you mm -hmm. know, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Um, sometimes as human nature, it's probably greater than the, sure. the initial situation. But, um, you know, they're looking to figure out ways to protect themselves. And so they're, you know, I think there are nine countries getting together to form sort of alliance to say, look, here's what we'll do and here's what we mm -hmm. won't do. Um, a lot of these factories extended terms to a lot of uh, suppliers. And so, you know, that's a trust factor. Mm -hmm. And so if the extended terms went to people that violated that trust through maybe real situations again, um, but didn't pay factories, you know, they're going to have to create ways that, that shore up their, their future also. And so, you know, I think that one of the future paths that will evolve because of this. You know, we talk in other episodes about the evolution, digital hyper right. exploding. Well, in the finance world, the same thing's going to happen. A lot of people have touched on the notion of blockchain technology. A lot of people, when they talk about blockchain technology, they're not really, hey, what does that, that mean? I know, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, but blockchain technology is certainly a solution as we, as we evolve into this new landscape where it it, it sort of protects both parties. You know, in the traditional finance system before blockchain, you had an option called a letter of credit. In situations where perhaps factories were not super comfortable with the credit of a particular customer, uh, it was in maybe a new relationship or they mm -hmm. just had heard bad things or in some countries, you know, the factory can borrow against a letter of credit for financing also. But that letter of credit would spell out things from the con from the customer side and say, look, if you do these, my bank will automatically pay you through this letter of mm -hmm. credit. Um, and it was sort of out of the hands of both parties once the agreement was made and the letter of credit was, credit was opened. Mm -hmm. You do this, that let, the money's going to go to you, and there's no way I can really stop it eventually. And um, there was always that bank transaction, there were always fees that were occurring. In the new space, blockchain technology sort of, in some ways, and I know banks don't feel super comfortable with this, but replace that banking transaction where requirements and agreements are set in one block. Mm -hmm. hey, in fact, if you do this in a digital space, we're going to put all these requirements. If you do this, then I put money in this block. Mm -hmm. And factory, when you apply the proper certifications and the, uh, you know, inspections and bills of lading in another block, mm -hmm. there's this almost automatic handshake that says, okay, you've satisfied your deal. I've satisfied mine and the money transfers. You know, it, it, I think it's a future of how business is going to evolve, I believe. Wow. Yeah, that is a lot to process. <laughs> so, you know, if, uh, if you have questions out there on, you know, navigating uh, this ever-changing climate and social compliance, we're very happy to um, schedule a consultation with you to um, help answer any questions you might have. Make sure to subscribe so you can stay apprised of upcoming episodes of Clothing Culture and follow us on our socials at Clothing Culture and at Stars Design Group. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sam.